Our guest today, Dr. Helene Gale, is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Chicago Community Trust, one of the nation's leading community foundations. The Trust works with donors, nonprofits, community leaders, and residents to lead and inspire philanthropy that improves the quality of life for the residents of the Chicago region. <clears throat> She was named one of Forbes' 100 Most Powerful Women, Foreign Policy Magazine's Top 100 Global Thinkers, and Newsweek's Top 10 Women in Leadership. Dr. Gale has author authored many articles on global and domestic public health issues, poverty alleviation, gender equality, and social justice. Her contributions have been honored with awards from Columbia University, Barnard College, Spelman College, Bryn Mawr College, the National Foundation for Infectious Disease, the US Public Health Service, and AARP, among others. She has received 13 honorary degrees and holds faculty appointments at the University of Washington and Emory University. Please welcome our very own Dr. Helene Gale. Thanks so much for that uh, very kind and generous introduction. It is so wonderful to be here, and as I look around the room and see so many friends and colleagues, it's just um, very gratifying um, to see so many of you here. I um, want to really recognize, uh, there's too many people for me to start recognizing, but I uh, want to recognize our uh, elected officials, of whom there are many, but particularly President Preckwinkle, who was uh, there at our front table. So many other, uh, Juan Selgado, who's right there, head of city colleges, um, and so many others. I know Anna Valencia is here, Candace Moore, um, Lisa Snyder Fabes, but so many people who are in this room who have been part of making my last two years such an incredible, incredible experience. And as I have said so many times, oh, and I forgot to mention John Palfrey, who's sitting here. Many people don't know he is the new head of MacArthur, one of our new colleagues. So just want to recognize John. You know, when I um, took this job a couple of years ago, I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. I didn't know a whole lot about community colleges. I didn't, uh, 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 community uh, foundations. Um, didn't know a lot about Chicago, hadn't, had never lived here, but it's really turned out to be one of the most gratifying experiences of my life. And so much of that is because of people in the room like you who made it their business like my social secretary over there, Les Coney, to make sure that <laughs> that that my, me uh, and my husband Stephen were really welcomed here, and um, it's been an incredible learning experience over this last couple of years. And I'm going to talk about some of the things that we have learned along the way, um, and that and so much of that depth of learning that has helped to inform where we want to go as an organization. I also want to just uh, recognize and say thanks to my husband who is here. Um, people may remember the last time I was here about a year and a, a, year and a half ago or so, I, I kind of subtly um, put out that he was looking for a job and didn't have a job. Um, you know, he, he now has a job, he works from home, and now he needs a wardrobe consultant. You know, I. <laughs> I, I go out. I go out a lot in the evenings, and um, you know, the mostly if it's not on a weekend, it says business attire. So I come home after a long day at work in my business attire, and Stephen greets me at the door with his pajamas. He says, "Well, that's business attire for me." So <laughs> anyway, uh, wardrobe consultant, uh, please. So, oops. Um, so what I'm, I'm, uh, what I want to do is talk, talk a little bit about the journey that we've been on and what we found that has helped um, to shape the direction, what we hope to accomplish, and then hopefully what all of you in this room can do to be part of uh, this journey with us. So to begin with, as you know, the Chicago Community Trust has been around for um, over 100 years, 105 years now. And we have hopefully been a powerful force in the region, touching nearly every 
a major civic issue. Um, but we were a little bit all over. And in, in 2018, we thought we should step back and think about what in fact could we do where we could not only, as we will always do as a community foundation, um, meet the basic needs of communities across this region, but what could we do in a way that was more focused where we would be able to say that we had had a sustained impact on something of great significance for this region. And as we looked at a lot of different areas, we could have focused on any one of the areas that you see here. Housing is a huge issue. Transportation, health, education, employment, homelessness. But what we recognized was that underneath all of those, um, at the very core of any of those issues was wealth inequality. And that if we didn't do something about addressing this um, growing wealth inequality that we see here in this region, we probably would only have short-term impact on, on any of these other issues. So we went on a learning journey and looked at data. So what did the data tell us? First of all, um, if you look at income, Despite record unemployment and a very, very strong job market, income inequality remains severe here. And if you look at, um, for every dollar that is earned by white, uh, 64 cents by Latinx and, and uh, just, 50, just below 50, 50 cent for African American. And now we know that income in itself is really just a surrogate for wealth because it's only a snapshot in time. But if income um, inequality exists, we know that the issues around wealth are probably even more severe. So when we looked at wealth and looked at this in a variety of different ways, and there's a lot of data uh, that go behind this, um, if we look at what we call liquid as acid poverty, how long does it take you if you don't have a paycheck before you drop below the poverty line? And so we looked at this measure and saw that 65% of black and Latinx Chicagoan are living on this financial edge, where loss of income beyond three months would push them below the poverty line compared to 28% of their white counterparts. We also saw that almost 30% of black and Latinx households have zero net income compared to 15% white. And it, anybody can imagine what that means to have zero net income. Any um, urgent, critical issue is going to push you over the edge. And if we looked at um, the issue of savings and banking, um, clearly in Chicago, the issue of the unbanked is a critical issue where nearly 20% of black and Latinx households are unbanked. And as a result of that, often have no recourse but to go to predatory payday lenders where, um, that are concentrated in, in communities of color and have annual interest rates as high as 400%. So imagine no bank, no recourse, but to take out a loan that puts you further and further into debt. In addition to that, if we think about from a neighborhood level and what we need to get economic vitality going in our neighborhoods, um, we see that while public sector and, and philanthropic dollars often do go to poor communities and communities of color, if we look at um, private investment, which is the investment to, stir, to, to, to spur economic um, vitality within neighborhoods, you see the investments, by and large, private investments are going to majority white neighborhoods compared to Latinx and uh, black neighborhoods. So where the, where the investment is most needed, private capital, um, is, is, there is clearly a mismatch. And if we look at you know, Chicago compared to the rest of the nation. And a lot of times we don't have all the data that we would like to have about this wealth gap, but we know that the wealth gap is growing nationally um, everywhere. However, if we look at where we rank as Chicago compared to the rest of the nation, when we look at national data, we can only uh, imagine that those data are even worse if we think about Chicago. So black unemployment, three times higher than the national average. 
uh, our our 30 year life expectancy gap is the largest in the nation. And many people saw that uh, report that just came out that said if you were in Streeterville, your average life expectancy was 90 years. But if you lived um, just nine miles away in Englewood, you lived to your life expectancy was 60 years. So this 30 year life expectancy gap, which is larger than any other city in the nation. Um, greatest population loss of 10 largest metro areas. We can't continue to expect economic growth if we're losing population and regional growth rates 67th among the 100th largest U.S. metropolitan economies. So how did we get here? I could give a separate talk on our learning journey. Um, we went on a journey to understand a lot of the issues that were never taught in school about our history and how bad policy decisions stemming from the end of slavery and our poor immigration and immigration, immigrant worker policies led to these inequities that we see today. Bad public policy based on racism and discrimination got us to where we are today. And so we need to work on ways in which uh, we don't only focus on the individual level, but we also look at what are the policies and what are the systems that are holding back and keeping people from recognizing their full potential. So whether it's redlining, contract buying, mass incarceration, unfair migrant uh, labor programs, we have public policy after public policy that actually fulfills its intended purpose to assure that access to opportunity was available to some, but not to others. And this inequity that we talk about is not just an issue for black and Latinx communities. Inequity affects the entire region. And while I approach this work from a social justice lens, fairness and justice says that everyone should have the opportunity to realize their full potential. In the end, we all play a great economic price for the inequity that our region faces. We know from studies done that the system of segregation costs the region somewhere in the neighborhood of $4 billion annually, and that if we were less segregated, the Chicago region's gross domestic product would rise by approximately $8 billion. The economic cost is great, but more than just the dollars and the cents, is what it does to the soul and spirit of families, people, and communities disinvestment, marginalization, being relegated to second-class citizenship. So these are all the things that we looked at as we thought about where we could have our greatest impact on um, addressing challenges in this region. I think this report um, that CMAP put out just last year says it best, unequal access to economic opportunity is holding all of Chicago back. We simply can't afford to keep players on the sideline. So let me talk about our strategy and what we hope to do over the next 10 years to address some of these issues that I've talked about. First of all, uh, I want to say thanks. It takes a village. We're talking about this, the, the work that we've been doing, but we've really been on a journey um, over the last 18 months, not just our staff and, and uh, the board of the Chicago Community Trust, but we've had hundreds of hundreds of people who have been engaged, working groups, outreach, roundtables, discussions, all of this so that we hope that this is a strategy that's not just the Chicago Community Trust, but this is a co-owned strategy, ourselves, other partners, and the community at large. So we hope that this is a strategy that does, it took a village to build it. We know it will take a village to execute it. So we look at the uh, components of our strategies. It's, it's a three-prong approach um, aimed at closing the racial wealth gap. First, looking at increased household wealth, along with catalyzing community-driven investment, and then building collective power. While this is, these areas and these elements will be our highest focus as a community foundation, we will always support key basic needs throughout the community, and we'll always maintain our commitment to making this the most philanthropic region there is in the nation. So this is our focus um, area, but that doesn't um, 
that, that doesn't leave aside our evergreen commitment to the whole community and to our uh, focus in philanthropy. So let me just take you through the elements of this very quickly, just to give you an idea. So if we think about what does it take to increase income at the household level, uh, it's, uh, increase household wealth, it's both, it's the combination of increasing incomes, building assets, uh, turning that income into assets, and then making sure that we reduce debt. So it's income plus assets minus debt. And if you look on that, it, it gives some examples of some of the kinds of things that we want to be involved in around I increasing um, incomes. Skills training and access to, to career pipelines, apprenticeship. Also looking at some of the policies like earned income tax credit, an expansion of earned income cre uh, tax credit, which can help to build financial stability at a household level. Building assets through things like home ownership, entrepreneurship, um, and, and again, looking at policies like baby bonds or child savings accounts that can help to create assets that can then be used and transferred. Reducing debt, uh, talked about the issue of payday loans, um, discriminatory fines and fees. And I know Anna Valencia is here and, and uh, city clerk's office did a lot and really pleased that the, um, uh, council, the city council recently passed an ordinance to start looking at these discriminatory fines and fees and, and that work will continue. Bail bond reform, etc. So I think looking at these issues of increased income, building assets, and reducing debt. Catalyzing community-driven investment, and I'm really thrilled about this because, you know, um, there's so much going on now, uh, whether it's um, the um, in, uh, Invest Southwest or Neighborhood Opportunity Fund, et cetera. There's a lot of things going on throughout the city that has recognized the importance in investing in disinvested communities. But we know that we, to do that and to do that well, there are a few things that we want to work on. First of all, building a foundation. How do you build a foundation? How do you make sure that the organizations that are working on the ground to um, make those investments actually effective have the capacity? So we want to invest in capacity building for black and Latinx community investment organizations. We want to take collective action. So really looking at how do you work across sectors? We know that to really uh, make these investments work. It's not one sector or the other, but it, we're gonna need to build new um, cross-sector platforms that will be able to take on these issues and then changing systems and particularly new ways of, of financing, innovative finance, looking at mechanisms that already exist, TIF reform, opportunity zones. How can we use those in a way that actually drive resources to communities that need them most? And then finally, building collective power at the community level. How do we make sure that we are uh, connecting networks of leaders, uh, elevating the community voice, and then providing a platform for communities to work together and have actions that create change. So we, look, we think of this as our people, voice, and action. And how do we actually build that collective power at a community level that enables citizens to take part in creating their change in their own communities? So our vision is of a thriving, equitable, and connected Chicago where all people of all races, places, and identity have the opportunity to reach their full potential. We believe that we can do this. Um, while I've given a lot of statistics where Chicago leads in ways that are not always positive, we also know that this is a city that has the ability to reinvent itself. It has so many assets, with, um, an engaged civic community. We're the nation's transportation hub. We have world-class universities, et cetera, et cetera. We are the number one best big city for the third year in a row by Condé Nast. So the, we know that we have incredible assets and a, an incredibly engaged community. So I believe to whom much is given, much is expected, Chicago can do this and be a beacon for the rest of the nation. Let me just close with a couple of, um, oh, uh, so what can you do? Um, <laughs> I, I've talked about what we want to do, but I want to also, also 
realize that this is not something that the Chicago Community Trust is going to do by itself. This is something that we all have a role to play, whether it's by testing your assumptions and understanding where we have our own biases. Um, learn the facts. Again, as I mentioned before, I think we went on a long learning journey and recognized there's so much we don't always understand about our history. How did we get to where we are today? Know the facts. Get connected. I love this uh, phrase that Brian Stevenson from the Equal Justice um, Initiative often talks about, being proximal. How do you get close to other people? Or the folded map project that um, uh, Tanika Allen has that actually looks at how do you put neighborhoods that are opposite each other, north, south, east, west, and put them together and figure out what they have in common so that they think about themselves as a connected city, not um, a disconnected city. So get connected. Be a voice for change. We all have opportunities where we can use our voice, um, where we can correct misconceptions when we're uh, with, with friends and neighbors, or we can advocate. You know, there's a lot of policy changes I've talked about where we need voices of people who are willing to talk about the things that can make a difference. Contribute time and resources, and last but not least, hopefully, um, you will want to partner with us on this journey. So let me just close. Um, I often find comfort in the wisdom of elders, and this is a, a fable that I thought um, was so apt when we think about what we're trying to accomplish here. It says, along the misty banks of the uh, Ancabra River lived a crocodile with two heads, but only one stomach, which both heads shared. Sadly, the two heads would fight over each other, uh, would fight over which would eat the food they caught, not understanding that whatever benefits one would benefit the other. Moral of the story, those who share the same destiny must work together. I think that's very apt when we think about where we are um, here in this city, in this moment. And I'll just close by saying, um, for us, this is our moonshot. For those of you who uh, were around I think I was about uh, 10 years old when um, President Kennedy first started talking about a moonshot. He talked about this moonshot as something just like exploring space or mountains, that we do it because it's hard, not because it's easy. And I think about our, the closing the racial wealth gap as our moonshot. We do it not because it's easy. We do it because it's hard, but we also do it because it's necessary. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gill. <clears throat> um, I was remiss earlier in not uh, acknowledging a couple of people who are with us today. Candace Moore, the first ever Chief Equity Officer for the City of Chicago. And also City Clerk Anna Valencia, whose work with her team on fines and fees is changing lives already. <laughs> okay, so we have a few questions. Just a reminder, blue, blue slips on your table. <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna start. Okay. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit about how um, the trust collaborates with other foundations and philanthropies uh, for higher impact, you know, whether it's MacArthur, which has a acknowledgeable, it's a, a more global presence, but still a lot of work in the city, Woods, Joyce, and others. Yeah, so one of the things um, that I, again, have been very gratified to come to Chicago and realize what a collaborative community it is. And the philanthropic community particularly um, works very closely together. So as an example, um, with, along with MacArthur, we started a project called Benefit Chicago, which um, provided uh, funds for small and medium-sized businesses, particularly businesses of color. Um, with a wide range of our philanthropic po uh, partners, we're involved in the Partnership for a Safe and Peaceful um, Community to really help looking at addressing the issue of um, youth vi violence and particularly focusing on on youth violence. So there, you know, there's we we recently um, with the mayor's office 
founded a philanthropic roundtable where we're going to be looking at ways that the philanthropic community can come together and look at where we're aligned with the interests of the mayor's office so that we can all work together in a much more coordinated way. So I, w I would just say there, um, there are um, lots of opportunity and this is one of those communities that I think is incredibly collaborative and I think we get a lot more done that way. All right. <clears throat> this question comes from John Rogers. <laughs> and you touched on this a little bit, but let's expand. You mentioned the importance of building entrepreneurship. What is the role of local anchor institutions, hospitals, universities, foundations, and museums, to name a few, to work with local minority-owned companies the way the trust has? Well, I'd love to see more. Um, you know, it's one of the areas that we're going to put a lot of focus on, um, looking at both providing capital but also um, learning networks for um, entrepreneurs, particularly entrepreneurs of color. And I think that there's lots of ways that organizations, whether they're philanthropic organizations or, you know, I look at uh, the collaboration of West Side United where the different hospitals on the West Side have come together and are looking at the social determinants of health, inc which include things like economic um, development and jobs. And they're actually using their balance sheet, they're using their own assets to actually create jobs and create opportunities. So I think everyone should be thinking about how do you use your institution um, in ways that can actually give others opportunities. And I think this investing in entrepreneurship um, is one where we think there's lots of returns. You create jobs, uh, you create income streams, and it helps the vitality of a community. And I think ultimately it gives community hope when they start seeing businesses spring up in their neighborhoods again. I think it's a sign that you know we're open for business. Yeah. Thank you for that. Let's go to a few from our online submittals. Um, okay, I, I may not pronounce this correctly, so excuse me if I don't. Um, Zoya McElrath? Zoya. Are you here, miss? Okay. Zoya um, McElrath. Uh, okay, got it. From Europe, what are some of the key factors driving wage disparity among young adults? Is it education, skills training, stable housing, or access to jobs? And how do we solve to those areas of concern? Yeah, well, I think it's all of the above. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I think um, sometimes it's a matter of skills. Sometimes it's a matter of homelessness. Um, you know, sometimes it's a matter of lack of, of access uh, and, and actual having jobs available. You know, I know there's a lot of great organizations that are working on some of those, and I think thinking about how can we scale up the ones that work best, uh, how do we make sure that we're doing the right analysis so we know what the real, what the obstacles are for any given cohort of young people. Uh, but I think there's, you know, sadly, it, it, is, a, it is not a uh, one, size fits all or one simple answer to what is a complex problem. Oftentimes young people who are coming from neighborhoods of concentrated poverty where they have not had the opportunity. Mm -hmm. okay. This one comes from Andrea Ortez, the Partnership for Resilience. How is the CCT's new strategic vision intended to support the greater Chicagoland area, specifically efforts in the suburbs aimed at providing relief for families that could not find stability in the city? Yeah, and so um, we want to work on both sides. We, we hopefully will work on um, communities where there's been lack of investment within the city so that those become neighborhoods where people want to move back, but we also know that there's been a lot of people um, pushed out into the suburbs, and so we're working um, particularly right now with, with um, President Preckwinkle and others in the south sur suburbs, really helping to develop some of the infrastructure there, both the civic infrastructure um, as well as the, uh, inf the physical infrastructure itself, so that um, neighborhoods and areas where there are now pockets of poverty outside of the city are also um, getting that kind of um, support and assistance. So we, you know, we are a regional foundation, although a lot of our focus is within the metropolitan um, Chicago, we also work um, regionally and particularly looking at this issue of the suburbs. Okay. Um, this is from Deb Schleiss, Chicago Child Care Society. How does the trust engage donor advised funds holders to support the trust strategic plan? 
Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, one of the things that we feel is an, is an advantage having uh, decided on a particular area of focus is that we can now work with our donors to say, here's here's something that we think can make a big difference if you invest with us. And so we're looking at a lot of different ways of, of co-investing. And I think in the past, while we were able to provide um, our donors and, and people who were donor advised fund holders, ideas about good organizations and organizations that were doing a, a good job. But I think now with this focus on closing the racial wealth gap, you know, we will have specific offerings that we can talk to our, our donors around. And so we hope that we will be able to align more of our donors to support some of the work that we're doing. As an example, we just had a, a grant um, to provide um, support for entrepreneurs of color. And we got a large number of grant uh, applications in um, and weren't able to fund all of those, but they were really, really great proposals. So we've now talked to some of our donors who um, were asking, do they want to co-fund these? Because these are great opportunities to actually build the entrepreneur in infrastructure. Um, and we love to have other opportunities like that where we can do co-funding with our, with our donor advised funds. Matthew McFarland asks, the bail pro he's with the Bail Project Chicago, could you please elaborate on how bail reform directly impacts closing the racial wealth gap? Well, I think um, it, you know, for, for many families who have to make a choice between whether they pay um, a medical bill or whether they pay a um, bail, uh, bail bill, you know, I think oftentimes for crimes that um, are small crimes where the person is no risk to themselves, their family, their neighborhood, their communities, you know, it's making people make very tough choices um, with very limited resources. So we, you know, we're looking at that as an issue. Is that a way in which we can help decrease the debt that people get into? And it, you know, we talk, we often talk a lot about assets, but we don't talk as much about the debt. And what are the things that um, plunge families into debt? And when you have a loved one who is incarcerated, you know, that becomes a priority. Um, but oftentimes, when people don't have the financial wherewithal, and they end up going in debt, they end up having to borrow money. They end up going to predatory lenders so you know we think it has a huge impact on the wealth of, of families now we know <coughs> excuse me we know you've done work overseas and have been um, applauded for that work here's a question about about a little touches on that often when we hear about developing countries quote unquote we know that education and income for women specifically can make the biggest impact in a given community. Do you see similar data here in the US and in Chicago? And if so, is there a focus on women head, heads of households in the effort to tackle poverty issues here? Yeah, we know that um, just like overseas, oftentimes um, women um, head of households have less opportunity for um, economic stability you know so some of the things we've talked about as an example you know could we expand the earned income tax credit it's a policy that exists if it was expanded if it was made more usable if some of if some of the um, restrictions on earning income that then takes you out takes you out of eligibility for an in, earned income tax credit if some of those things could be shifted so that they actually meet the needs of um, working families more often and many times that's women you know I think there are a lot of things like that where where we do need to think about what's the impact particularly on single um, house uh, women headed ho uh, single households <laughs> women yeah um, so I, you know it is an area of, of interest we, but we want to look at it um, based on you know where we think we can have the greatest difference mm -hmm. okay um, from Sonia Malunda, Associated Colleges of the Midwest, how will you measure success? Oh, I had a whole slide on there. Uh, <laughs> so we have 10-year goals, and we have goals that are based on both um, what do we want to see happen, you know, so for instance, in, in the strategy that focuses on um, um, neighborhood um, investment, we want to make sure that we are 
measuring that there is actually more investment going into some of the neighborhoods where investment isn't currently flowing. When we look at the issues of increasing collective power, we want to see that neighborhoods are actually taking more actions than they would have in the past. Um, we want to look at medium um, income as well as, as the difference in wealth over time between black, Latinx, and white households. So we'll, we'll be measuring median wealth to be able to actually look at that over time. So, you know, we, we really have looked at how are we going to have metrics that demonstrate we're making progress against the different strands that we've um, developed. And if anybody wants to really geek out and um, we'll be happy to show you all of, all of what we've done around that, uh, around uh, metrics. Okay, Alicia Tate from Cabrini Green Legal Aid. At what point do we explore dismantling some of these inequitable systems, like criminal justice, as opposed to reforming them. How do we begin creating new systems that work for people? Yeah. Um. <laughs> it's a, it's a little, little light question. Yeah. So I, I'm not even going to pretend to really answer that question. <laughs> you know, but what? Uh, what I will say, and I, you know, in all seriousness, and I've said it before, you know, bad public policy got us to where we are, and it's only by looking at better public policy that we're going to really have the sustained impact. And so I think we have to be willing to be bold and look at what systems um, either no longer work, don't work well for everybody, and then what can we do to revive those, re revise those systems? I'm not sure we're going to start a revolution um, tomorrow, but you know, I think as we continue to look at what are the things that are holding people back from realizing their potential, what are the obstacles, and what are some of the systemic ways in which that occurs, I think we have to be willing to actually tackle some of those systems that were designed to keep some people behind. And I think unless we attack some of those systems, you know, we are only going to continue to have short-term gains and not have the longer-term impact that I think we want to have. Okay, our good friend Graham Grady, Taft Law Firm. What is the role of the Trust's affinity groups in the work? Okay, it, it, Graham happens to be a part of our African American legacy <laughs> affinity group. Yep. Um, you know, we created these affinity groups um, and feel like they're an incredibly important part of our organization in kind of a bi directional way. We want to make sure that um, as we have kind of gone on this journey and carved out this territory, that our affinity groups are also thinking about how they can contribute, but we also look to our affinity groups who often fund small grassroots organizations that we may not be working directly with, are also able to feed that back. What are, what are you hearing? Uh, what should we be doing differently? And so we really look at our affinity groups as both um, someone, uh, organizations where hopefully we can influence the direction of their work, but also that they can help to be a voice for the communities that we hope to, to be um, responsive to. All right, Manzi Smith, thank you for this question. You mentioned African American and Latinx. What about Native Americans in the area who have essentially been erased from Chicago history and have become invisible? Yeah, and you know, we, we put a real focus on African American and Latinx population. Both are about a third of the, of the population here in Chicago. And so, you know, if you look at it from a numerical standpoint, where you're going to make the biggest difference, and where have the, um, the um, differences been most sustained, uh, clearly, you know, a focus on Latinx and, and African American community is going to um, bubble up. On the other hand, we know that a lot of the things that we're doing will have impact far beyond Latinx and African American communities. You know, particularly again, if we think about the policy realm, if we're able to put to to really look at some of the policies that are discriminatory or policies that could actually have an impact, um, if we're able to bring economic vitality back to neighborhoods where there has been a lack of of uh, economic engine, I think there's a lot of the sort of things where I, I think we believe that it will lift um, boats 
beyond just African American and, and Latinx community. But I think that doesn't, again, you know, we're a community foundation and we, while this is a, a specific focus of ours, that doesn't mean that we're not going to think about the needs of the whole community. And I think we think about issues of homelessness or hunger or violence and other issues that we still are focused on and we still uh, provide resources for it. They oftentimes um, uh, are, they often affect more than just African American and uh, Latinx community, and they affect communities who are living in poverty or living um, in difficult circumstances across the board. This comes from Suzanne Malik McKenna, who is curious about how you hold your organizations accountable. Now, organizations, I'm assuming, as grantees? Yes. Yeah, okay. Hold your grantees accountable um, so as not to mm -hmm. actually exploit black and brown communities. Uh, well, you know, w w we have a fairly rigorous um, due diligence process. Um, we fund organizations that have a track record of working with African American um, and, and communities of color. Um, we also look at the representation of people of color in leadership, people of color on their boards, et cetera. So, you know, we really do try to make sure that we're working with organizations who are of, by, and for the communities that uh, they serve. Mm -hmm. All right, this is one of our online questions from Elena Harkness. Water is one of our region's most abundant resources. It is also threatened, and with a changing climate, can be a threat to communities. What is the trust doing to spur action on water issues and keep equity at the forefront? Great, and Michael Davidson, who's there, um, could probably answer this in, in a um, lot more detail than I can, but we've been working um, uh, with the Our Great Rivers project for a long time in partnership with Metropolitan um, Planning Council, where we've been looking at communities that live near water um, and looking at how do you have economic development that also takes into consideration the environment. And so that's something that we've been committed to uh, over, it's been over about five years or so that we've been working on this plan um, to really make our waterways part of economic development, but doing that in a way that also recognizes the importance of it as a natural resource. Okay, we've got just a few more questions. Um, this is from Dave Cotuno, Communities in Schools of Chicago. What role do you believe education, and specifically a high school diploma, plays in, cha in, uh, in facing, wait, sorry, let me, what role do you believe education, and specifically a high school diploma, plays in the inequities Chicago faces today? Yeah, a um, lot could be said about education. I think I would say it's um, necessary, but not sufficient. Um, we all know that getting an education is kind of, you know, a bottom line um, important element to getting a job and uh, having a career, et cetera. Uh, but we also know that education in this city, just like uh, so many cities around the nation, is not all equal. And I think working to bring about um, greater equity in education is a huge priority I know for this administration one that we need to continue to work on because it's you know it, it is the basis by which people can at least get started on moving forward and having um, a, a career pipeline okay uh, Richard Roberts Roberts Horizons Communications will the Chicago Community Trust be funding small storefront theater programs and new playwrights um, not as a category specifically, I, you know, I mean, I, I, we want to look at building vibrant neighborhoods. That could be part of it. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a program specifically for that, but we do believe that arts and culture are part of building vibrancy within communities. Uh, we don't have an arts uh, and culture portfolio. Uh, we have really kind of integrated our work against our goal of um, closing the racial wealth gap, but as we think about what creates vitality in communities, arts and culture is one of those things, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, this comes from James Gilliam. How can we, as a responsible group, push out predatory issues in black and brown communities? Regulate them as we regulate banks, dot, dot, dot. When you say predatory issues, I guess you're talking about things like predatory lending, um, 
you know, and, and so it's an area that we're looking at. I think there's two sides of it. There's both, can we get financial institutions to develop pro products that would be more flexible and meet the needs of people who may not have the same type of um, credit and, and credit worthiness that you, know, you and I might have. So can banks think about more flexible ways? Can banks think about ways that um, actually lend to people who would be considered otherwise high risk? And then in addition to that, you know, can we look at caps? Other states have had have developed caps on on um, interest for payday lenders. So I think we want to work on both sides. Both, you know, can we develop regulations to ca cap that interest rate so that it's not this runaway 400 percent um, interest rate for for predatory lending? But can we also work with financial institutions to make it easier for people who um, are still in the process of building their, their credit rating uh, and make it flexible and easier for them to do that so they don't end up having to go to a payday lender? Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Gale, we want to thank you very, very much for coming today. Thank you. I have a couple things. Thanks for watching. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.